Hello and welcome to the Capital Games Movie Club. I am the Wiz. And I'm Zero. Zero. Uh, as this is close to July 4th, we made the decision to start watching some patriotic kind of movies, maybe? Sort of. Yeah. Sort of, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And your choice this week was John Favreau's 2008 movie, The uh, 2008 movie Iron Man, starring Robert Downey Jr., Terrence Howard, and Jeff Bridges. Um, before we get started, I, I, I kind of have to ask, what was what 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 made you think of this as a a, a patriotic movie? Well, just um, you've got the intro, which just um. Uh, Tony Stark selling the biggest, baddest weapons for the U.S. military to kind of um, fend off, uh, help the U.S. fend off its war on terror sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And then sort of a gradual descent of, of hey, the, the military industrial complex is a bit corrupt. Um, I love my country, but damn it, I've got a mission to be responsible for my country. So just um, Iron Man has his own sort of patriotism. Hmm. In my mind, and that's kind of why I picked it to kind of prelude um, towards um, uh, the July Fourth celebration. So, like a quasi-progressive kind of patriotism, like um, we kind of suck and we have to do better. But by yeah. Love my okay. Yeah. Okay. Kind of a. I love my country, but damn it all, my country is not perfect, and I'm gonna do something about it. Okay. All right. I get it. Yeah, because I I watched this film this morning. And after I watched it, I was like, wait a minute. I was just patriotic. <laughs> <laughs> wait a minute. <laughs> Hold up. I know there were scenes of patriotism in Iron Man 2. I remember that. and It was pretty overt. But I I, I, I watched the film this morning, and I'm like, I'm, I'm not seeing it. <laughs> it's like, where, where, where is this? But okay, I get it now. Okay, cool. Um... Okay, so, what did you think of 2008, uh, John Favreau's 2008 film, Iron Man? It's um, just an all-around great movie. Um, it doesn't get, like, I guess, too pretentious about itself. It kind of sets itself up as um, as something that you would expect. Uh, it just, Iron Man is kind of the, the playboy... Uh, entrepreneur but he's also kind of uh, kind of a lovable asshole in a, a sort of way mm -hmm. so um for me just just that sort of met the portrayal that i've always had of iron man just yeah he's he's kind of brilliant but yeah he's he's kind of an asshole sometimes but uh, damn it all you just can't help it uh, but just kind of appreciate just how much thought he puts into his wacky engineering projects right and the, the the film showcases in literally the first 30 seconds why Robert Downey Jr. was was perfect for this role, why he was born to play this role. And it, it in most movies, that the way that they, they uh, represent the character and they show it off the way they did, he would come off as an insufferable, unlikable asshole. But even, like, the, the first shot of the movie is him in a Humvee with a bunch of so soldiers in fatigues, uh, all dressed, all, like, in their, in their nines and with their guns. And just, and then there's him with an alcohol drink and a glass and, a, and a, like, a, an expensive suit saying, there, oh, why are we so quiet? <laughs> so, like, and in most movies like that, they would portray that character as a complete unlikable douche. And in that scene, they not only dispelled the fact that he... Well, they didn't dispel the fact that he's an asshole. They kind of revel in the fact that he is. But they also show how charismatic and likable he is. So it, it, it did a fantastic job to show just who, who the character is and what he's like in about a minute. And from, yeah. the, from there on... The film does a fantastic job humanizing and representing and representing Tony Stark and the character of Iron Man throughout the entire movie. Like, it, and without Robert Downey Jr. in the role, it just wouldn't work. So on that, like, on that note, it was, it was 
perfectly done, perfectly cast for the role. Um, yeah, um, for me, I think the fun part of the intro, just to kind of um, lay into the whole lovable ass, uh, the lovable asshole aspect of it, is um, I think the line was. Because, good God, um, why am I being court martialed? What did I do wrong? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yep. <laughs> and then, of course, when he finds out that um, uh, one of the uh, one of the soldiers in the uh, Humvee is a woman, uh, just his reaction is just kind of priceless too. He's like, "Good God, you're a woman." <laughs> <laughs> oh, you got excellent cheek structure. <laughs> yeah. And then he's then he kind of lays into it, he's like, "Now I can't help but look at you." <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, like. And you need a skilled actor who is very charismatic to pull that off. And I know everyone loves Robert Downey Jr. now after he's played Tony Stark for so long, but I don't think he gets enough credit for how he pull how well he pulled that off. I mean, Robert Downey Jr. is a skilled actor who is really good. It's just that before Iron Man. He was more known for his antics off screen than his performances on screen, which is a shame. But unfortunately, it was unfortunate. But but it happened that way. So yeah. Um, right. What else in the movie so far? I mean, yeah. Just this is the Robert Downey Jr. show, and. If you, I don't know how you couldn't like him now, but if you don't like him, yeah, it's not really worth watching the movie because he is the strongest part of this movie. He is the best character in the movie, and he essentially he, he is essentially the movie. I mean, you, you do have a bunch of characters that that get started that are part of the whole MCU. Throughout the entire throughout the entire run of the MCU, such as Happy, Pepper Potts, Agent Coulson, um, eventually Nick Fury at the very 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 end. But it it was interesting to watch this movie, knowing how the MCU turns out, like a decade and a half later, and it, it's interesting because without this movie working so well i don't there wouldn't be an mcu because the the movie works as a template really well for all the other movies that came out so much so that they literally cribbed this entire template on every single superhero movie that was an origin story so yeah like the the the, the template and blueprint for i would say probably the best origin story for a a superhero film was made in this movie and it you, when you watch it you can really see why yeah and i totally agree too um especially because just it it just doesn't really go too hard in into the comic fandom uh, spectrum because um just i'll um i'll fess up and say that i'm not the biggest comic fan yeah i appreciate comics i appreciate uh, the media that is related to comics, so stuff like video games and uh, the TV shows that are associated with some of the um, big mainstream superheroes and stuff, but you couldn't ask me, like, which issue Iron Man fought a certain character. I'm not going to know, but mm -hmm. um, when I watched it many, many years ago for the first time, it was just fun. It just yeah. didn't seem like it was um, too high up on itself. I remember in the late 90s when uh, X-Men came out, and I was a big comic book fan, but um, watching X-Men now uh, and, and comparing it to Iron Man is just... And same thing with Spider-Man 1. Um, comparing it to Iron Man, you... you they do care... And some will find this a little funny to hear. They do care more in those films previously about they do care more about comic book fans and making sure it's authentic enough to where they bring up winks and nods and clever asides and uh, things that comic book fans will enjoy 
more in those films than they do, I would say, in MCU films. I think we had a conversation with somebody earlier today where really as good as the MCU movies are, they're really not faithful to comics. But I think that's a good thing to a point because if you're gonna if you're going to adapt something from a previous art form, you need to adapt it to the, the to the current art form. And my issue always has been with with mainly fans of comic books who get really pissy about oh it's not true to the comic it's not true to the character that I I've known for sixty years is that. They, you have to adapt it to a movie. You have to make it like you have to make it work for a movie first, because yeah, there are there are movies that are comic book movies that are extremely faithful to the comics that fucking suck to watch. They're painful to watch, and the reason why is because they care too much about the 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 comp, the comic book representation and not enough about making a good movie. Um, one example that I use, and I think people will be shocked to hear this, is Watchmen. A lot of people love Watchmen, and the reason why is because they literally just took the comic and just shot it scene for scene, cut for cut, from the comic book. And while I understand why some people enjoy that and said that's great, you should do that more, the, the issue is with a comic book you have to put more detail in in order to get, give the characters more of a fleshed out appearance and give them more of a fleshed out character. Whereas a movie, you can cut that out by having an actor do a certain affliction or you can have a certain line or you can do a certain scene a certain way to better represent a character or a scene in a movie. You don't need to do all that detail. And... That was the issue I had with Watchmen, is that they took the, the... All they did was just take the comic book, shoot it as a film, and that's it. Where you could have edited it down to a good hour 45 or two hours and been just fine. But they made it into a three-hour film. And I, I get people love the film, but I just... I, I, I My often criticism of that film is they forgot to adapt it into a movie. And really shows so um did you did you have experience watching x-men or spider-man in the past um no just um i want to say that with both movies they were stuff that was on in the background with family watching it but uh, i really wasn't much into movies at the time so it was just kind of oh that's neat yeah and then just kind of tuned it out you watch them now and they're pretty campy um the, the original X-Men, like I said, I watched it when it came out in the theaters, and I loved it. Watching it now, though, it, it's it, it's a camp fest. It's it's not bad. I, I like it still, but from, from when it first came out, me being blown away by how they portrayed the characters, watching it now is kind of like, eh. <laughs> if I didn't have a previous... My issue with the X-Men movie now is if I didn't have a previous relationship with the characters already, I, I don't think I would have had a strong reaction to the to the movie. So, that was definitely a problem back then. Which the MCU movies uh, correct by fleshing out the character to a point where you can identify them and giving them enough room to breathe and to make them more likable in that way, which Iron Man does very well in this. Go ahead. It's kind of funny that you mentioned camp, okay. mostly because um, uh, there was kind of one funny sticking point that um, I did have with Iron Man mm -hmm. back when it came out, and I, it still remains to this day. A lot of the movie is a goddamn glorified art, uh, uh, advertisement to Audi's cars and Dell computers. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I guess I'm I'm just I don't notice it very much because I was more transfixed on Robert Downey Jr.'s performance in the movie. But that's kind of con before the MCU was the MCU. That's 
that was kind of common back then when it came to action movies to have product placements all over the place so they can fund the movie more because I, I i don't think people realize that iron man was a, a big risk for paramount and for marvel marvel studios i mean oh they, yeah absolutely I mean, they, they literally took what was essentially a B-list character in Marvel Comics. I mean, people knew who Iron Man was, but not a lot of people knew the ins and outs of him. But they took a, a B-list character, made an entire movie about over that character with a well-known but honestly disgraced actor, and basically said, we got to give it a shot, so here we go. But thankfully, they had a really good writer and director who treated the – and that's this is the key thing, too. They treat the source material with respect while still adapting it to a film, which I think a lot of the MCU does this very well with, with some issues. But uh, they did it very well to the point where – like you can be happy with the portrayal of the of the movie of the character, and and still enjoy the movie as is. Like if you had, you had no previous knowledge of Iron Man, right? Before watching this, bare minimal knowledge. Bare minimal. Okay, so the fact that you can enjoy this movie without that knowledge just shows how well made the film is, and that was a lot of people. Uh, Iron Man made a ton of money not because of comic book fans. It's because a lot of people heard, this is a really good movie. And it it still is. It still is a very good movie. All in all, just, um, it was fun. Um, j- the uh, the shoehorning of uh, the Audi cars and the Dell um, desktop computer that was in uh, Tony Stark's office and some of the uh, Blade servers that are in like one of... Um, Tony's workshop shots and stuff like that. It was kind of funny, uh, mostly because I'm a, a tech and car guy, so it was just like, wow, they're really laying it thick, aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I, I didn't notice that at all. Like, it, it didn't bug me at all. Like, I, I, I think if it was a lesser film, I probably would have noticed. But, yeah. Like, I'm not a car guy, so... I I couldn't tell whether a car was an Audi, a Porsche, or a Lamborghini. I, I couldn't tell. So I was like, it's a car. Cool. So I didn't notice. I, I'll be honest. So <laughs> let's let's get into other performances in the movie. Um, the other principal actors were Terrence Howard as, as Rhodey, which is an interesting topic to talk about if we get into it. Uh, Gwyneth Paltrow as Pepper Potts. And... Jeff Bridges is Obadiah Stane. Uh, is it Obadiah or is it Obadiah? It's Obadiah, thank you. Um, why don't you go first? What, what other what did the other performances stand out to you? Anything that you liked, disliked? What What did you think of the other performances? Um, Jeff Bridges as Obadiah was really really good. Mm-hmm. Um, there's definitely one line towards the end of the movie that just the delivery is so 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 perfect mm-hmm. and um i guess we're already in spoiler territory at this point <laughs> um no i mean well hmm. you know what okay you know what we'll do that then uh spoiler for the next uh in five seconds for iron man 2008 uh we will start in five four three two one okay go right ahead so um the one line uh, that Jeff Bridges just nails the delivery on, and it's towards the end of the movie where just um, you find out that you know Obadiah has been uh, been double dealing under the table. He's um, uh, he has uh, Raya from the Ten Rings uh, help uh, piece together uh, the first prototype of the Iron Man suit so he can build it um, in the Stark Industries factory and everything, um, and of course just. Um, the one thing he doesn't have is the power source. Mm-hmm. And of course, just um, you see this frantic scene of these scientists they are on the phone talking with each other and going, I don't know how to figure it out. I, I don't know how to how to do what what he's asking and everything. And then uh, then they see they see Obadiah kind of walking into this lab and they're like, oh, my God, uh, I'll call you back. And then 
and then just he's pretty much demanding a status report going okay just have you all figured out how to shrink this gigantic freaking arc reactor into into the size of a human heart and of course just the poor scientist is kind of stammering trying to figure an excuse to say uh yeah no i i can't do it and everything and then of course just this is where the delivery line hits and it and just just um you hear uh, uh you hear just obadiah going tony stark built one of these in a cave with a box of scraps <laughs> it's just yeah. like god he just nailed the delivery holy yeah. cow <laughs> Uh, he plays a detestable ass, uh, like a detestable human being in this so well, and he he did the character really well uh, as well because in the beginning of the movie he's yeah he he is smarmy and unlikable but he's kind of positioned as a father figure to Tony Stark in the beginning, and the gradual slipping of the mask was done really well by Jeff Bridges in this. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, especially like when you get to uh, when you get to sort of just um, the one pivotal sequence where just Tony's kind of working on the suit and everything, and uh, he's watching the news, and they're just like, "Oh yeah, so we're here at the firefighters' benefit for um, uh, um, that's being held by Tony Stark and everything." And um, yeah, just we're not going to be seeing Tony Stark because apparently he's got some really wicked PTSD. So, you know, uh, here's, here's that. And then of course, Tony kind of goes, um, Whoa, I wasn't invited to that. What the hell's going on? And kind of surprise shows up and everything. And, yeah. you know, Obadiah just tries to play kind of the protective father a bit in, in the early part of that sequence. He's like, Hey, um, yeah, don't make a scene. Okay. And yeah. then of course, just, Tony gets confronted by the Vanity Fair reporter, and she's just like, hey, why is your company still selling weapons to, like, terrorists? And then that's that's kind of where just the mask gets just torn off because he confronts Obadiah, and he's just like, dude, we can't be, we can't be dealing under the table. This is, this is fucked up. This is wrong. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, just, just, he kind of, um, uh, they're being surrounded by reporters and photographers and everything, and he just kind of goes, "Hey, um, you know, just uh, let's let's take a picture with all these, you know, reporters and photographers," and then just kind of whispers under his breath, "Yeah, um, you, you know who who screwed you over um uh, on um on the uh, direction of the company and who filed the injunction against you? It was me." Yeah, and it's just like, "Holy cow, that's one hell of a way to just tear the mask off and go." Yeah, I've been trying to take the company from out from under you. Yeah, but he, he also frames it as I did it for your own good. Which, yep. Uh, which keeps the mask on slightly as I'm protecting you from yourself to a certain yep. extent. So you can still look at that and go, maybe he is still protective of Tony Stark. But then you learn towards the end that no, he's not. He is out for his own gain. Um no, Jeff Bridges is really good as a villain in this. Um, being familiar with Iron Man back then, though, I found it really weird that Obadiah Stane was the main villain of this movie, but it still is very effective. Uh, when they mentioned the Ten Rings, like, immediately I was thinking, when I saw it in the theater, immediately I was thinking, oh, Mandarin, awesome. But no, that didn't happen. But, um... Yeah. Um, but, yeah... But Mandarin we'll get into maybe another time because that's another can of worms that uh <laughs> Oh man. Anyway. Um I think we should talk about Terrence Howard. Um Terrence Howard played Rhodey in the movie, who would go on to be War Machine in the later movies. Um As much as I like Terrence Howard as an actor, I don't think he was I don't think he was right for the part. And the reason why is Terrence Howard is a very charismatic actor, but he's very loud. He's bombastic. He's uh, he's very personality driven. Rhodey ain't that. Rhodey is a very... He is the foil to Tony Stark. He is not bombastic at all. He is very stoic. He is very uh, 
well mannered. He is also very uh, he he is the rock for Tony Stark. Pretty much, he is the person that has to basically be the one that shakes his head, going, "Oh God, Tony, what are you doing?" And Terrence Howard can't really play that. He himself is very bombastic, very personality based. He actually, if Tony Stark was black, Terrence Howard would be Tony Stark. That's that's who that's who Terrence Howard would be. So he was miscast in this. I think was he bad? No, but and this is looking back as now Don Cheadle as being Rhodey now for seven or eight films and and in a TV series. Um, he was miscast in this, and they corrected it later on with Don Cheadle. But it is weird knowing the history of the making of the movie and how Terrence Howard became got into the movie and and his story afterwards. But it, he was miscast in this. I thought. I I I thought that. Um, yeah, that's all I could say. He was miscast. He was okay, but. He wasn't good. He wasn't the right fit for the role. Yeah. <clears throat> and that's understandable, too, since um, with the minimal knowledge that I had of Iron Man and everything, I was just like, hey, you know, just he's a little bit he's a little bit more um, more on the loud side, especially just when <clears throat> uh, Rhodes is always just sort of uh, kind of the counterbalance for, mm -hmm. uh, for Tony. And it was just like he's he's not terrible, but he's. He's definitely a little bit on the loud side compared to just someone that that is supposed to be the counterweight to Tony Stark's eccentricness. Right. And and again, we, we are comparing this now to Don Cheadle, who has played Rhodey for every other movie since. But watching it now and then watching Don and watching Terrence Howard in this role now and watching Don Cheadle, you you definitely see a stark difference no pun intended uh to how each actor portrayed this role and i don't you know what i don't know if it's because the movie didn't utilize roadie as well but i i just looked at this and said that this is really a waste of terrence howard's talents like it, there was no way that roadie was going to be someone that Terrence Howard could really chew into and get a good performance out of because that that's not Terrence Howard's style. So, yeah, I think it was uh although he is he is okay in the movie, I just throughout the film when he was on there I was like, yeah, this is this doesn't feel good. This doesn't feel right. So, and again, it might be because I've now been comparing it to Cheadle and Yes, I do think Cheadle is a better, more well-rounded actor, but Terrence Howard is a good actor in his own. I guess the last person that we talk about is Gwyneth Paltrow, who plays yeah. Pepper Potts. <clears throat> um, when I first saw Iron Man, I kind of was like, eh, with Gwyneth Paltrow. And it was mostly because... Gwyneth Paltrow was still a big star at the time when she was in this movie. And I was kind of surprised that they completely underutilized her in this. But she's good, I guess. I mean, again, she, she just basically played a, a dutiful secretary slash love interest. So it's not really an interesting role to bite into. And, and, yeah. she, and, she, and again, as time goes on, she does get better at the role. She gets more meaty roles. She gets uh, a better scripts and screenplays to go through as the character. She gets more of a, a defined personality. But yeah, in this movie, she's she's okay. But I think that's more of the fact that they didn't write her to be anything more than a love interest, really. So. Oh yeah, <clears throat> though um, the writing for her ha um, in some parts is quite excellent. Um, Especially um, one of the best lines was in uh, that they gave uh, Pepper Potts in the beginning was just after uh, after Tony sleeps with the Vanity Fair reporter and everything, and the Vanity Fair reporter wakes up and everything, and then of course 
um, the reporter decides to try to make a clever crack that you know just just um, uh, uh, Pepper is is the whipping girl for Tony Stark and everything and and of course Pepper in classy fashion goes yes I take care of any uh, uh, anything that uh, Mr. Stark needs including taking out the trash and I was just like yeah. ooh that's that is that is a good and spicy delivery yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it was all right. I it, it was a, it was a decent delivery and a decent joke, but but does it really define a personality? Does it really give her no, any? I mean, it, it it's, a, it's a decent role. It, it, it's, I mean, it's a, it's it's a decent line. Yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll give it that. But yeah, yeah, it's just more just um, the fact that it sort of plays into um, the fact that uh, Pepper is usually a pretty clever and witty person. Yes. Um, so it was just like. Wow, that was that was some pretty good writing there, just to kind of hone in on the whole. Um, she's got a very sharp and clever personality, sort of thing. Yeah. Um, let's get into, I guess, the action in the film. Um, compared to other MCU films, it's mu- it's pretty muted. It's decent, but it. But I think the only action scenes are the scenes where, okay, the the escape from the cave. Him returning to that nondescript area in Afghanistan and fighting off those terrorists as Iron Man. And then his fight with Obadiah. I mean, those are the only three action scenes there are. Unless you want to count the the flying test sequences, which I, I kind of don't. Like, those are the only three. And they're not exactly exciting. They're, they're good, but they're not really... They're not... Yeah, they're not really, like balls to the wall excitement it's just like yeah they're okay they're good and then with how the cgi was back then you could definitely tell that there is a difference in cgi in in this one so i definitely had that a kind of it was kind of an issue i was okay it didn't bother me so much like you could tell when iron man when they have iron man on screen when it's cgi or not which is pretty much all the time, so it was. It was a. The action was okay, but uh, okay. What, what did you think of the action? Um, I mean, the action was um, just plenty serviceable. It wasn't terrible, but it wasn't extremely exceptional either. Right. Um, there are some silly moments and everything, like when um, S- Stark ends up like whacking a guy on the escape and. Um, his arm gets stuck in the wall and everything for a bit. Yeah. And, and the guy just cu- goes, Hey, let me shoot, let me shoot this metal helmet and the bullet ricochets and just kills him on the spot and everything. Yeah. Uh, you had some silly moments like that in, in some of the fights and everything, but yeah, just um, overall um, the fights um, again, plenty serviceable, just nothing super exceptional or super crazy, but they weren't, completely dull either i was surprised that i i came out of it with the action not being being okay but not great because when you think of iron man you think of action you think of him flying around you think of shooting his pew pews and stuff on his hands but this is really a character drama or or a character film really because the most interesting parts of the movies of the movie was uh tony stark growing and then eventually him building the Iron Man suit. Some of the best scenes of the film are him testing the different parts of the suits. And they were, they were hilarious at times. Oh, yeah. So, you have any other parts that you want to talk about? Um, no, uh, Not really. I mean, just overall, uh, just fun fun movie to watch and everything. Just, um, even, even today, just um, uh, watching it now, it was still fun. It, it wasn't something that aged poorly, is I guess what I'm trying no. to say. No, not at all. It uh, and it just usually when you go back to um, a franchise and you see the beginning of uh, beginning of that franchise, you tend to notice like, okay, this is where it started. This is where they got the character. These are the holes that they had to plug in that, that they eventually plugged in later. But you. You didn't have that in this movie, really. It's still... You're right. It's still a solid film. It's still a, a very enjoyable film that even if 
you didn't follow the entire MCU um, throughout its time. How how uh, how much did you go through the MCU, by the way? Hmm. Um. Really, it was at least for me. Um, Iron Man one, two, and three. Okay. Um. First Avengers, Second Avengers, and um. I hate to admit it, but that's really it. <laughs> that, I think that's what most people are at this point, is basically Iron Man 1, 2, and 3, and all the Avengers movies. Oh, wait, you didn't see Endgame or Infinity War? No, um, mostly okay. because just after the first two movies, I just got so burnt out. I was just like, all right, really? I'm going to take a break, and then I'm going to try to pick these up whenever, and then I never picked them back up. I've seen all of them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I've seen every single MCU movie. And yeah, basically, Iron Man is the template for all of them. So when you introduce a new character, they use the Iron Man method, which is basically introduce the character before he becomes a hero, have them go through their transition, have them go through their transformation, they become the hero, they beat the villain, and then they hint towards better things to come. That's... That is literally what Iron Man is, and that's literally what every single superhero origin story film is. Like, from Thor, to Captain Marvel, to Captain America, to onwards. That, that's, that has been the formula ad nauseum, pretty much, to every single new character, that they, and every single movie that they have that has a new character in it. So, and, and knowing that, and knowing that formula is so well worn it was really nice to watch the movie and still and still realize it's a solid film even though that formula has been shred so much that like i i could still i can still see the skeleton in the in the body when you when examining the film so um, there is one piece of interesting trivia, mm -hmm. and this one uh, is more just from the fact that um, I'm into photography. Okay. And um, so right around when the movie came out, there was one shot in particular that was really interesting. Um, it's towards the beginning where they kind of show all the magazine covers that Tony Stark and Obadiah have been on. Mm, yeah. And it's the one where you see the space shuttle on the back. You see um, Obadiah kind of on the left and Tony in the bottom. Um, that shot, interestingly, was not taken by the actual film crew. Um, the film crew was sort of looking around for just interesting uh, pictures on social media of just um, people who'd been to some of the uh, space stations around the U.S. And apparently just um, this photographer just kind of had this picture's um, floating, I think, on Instagram, if I remember the story correctly. And apparently just the uh, team behind um, uh, the Iron Man cinematography basically reached out to this photographer and said, hey, um, we actually would love to use this picture for a movie. We can't disclose what movie it is, and you'd have to sign an NDA, mm -hmm. but we'd love to use this picture. And at the time, the photographer was just like, yeah, okay, sure. Just um uh um you can completely buy the rights to the picture off of me and stuff. Just this was something that I just sort of took for fun and I'm not really a a major commercial photographer for, or anything. So, oh yeah, whatever. And apparently just um after that agreement just just they had kind of um went off um going, "Yeah, I wonder what movie that picture's going to be used in." And it turned out it was Iron Man that they kind of photoshopped in Obadiah and um, Tony Stark into that image. And I was just like, whoa, holy cow, what a, what a way to kind of find out that your your piece of artwork just made it into a movie. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. Uh, yeah, that's interesting. Um, yeah, the only trivia I have is basically what happened with Terrence Howard, really. Um, I'll get into it real quick, I guess. Um Shortly after, uh, the interesting about thing about Terrence Howard in this movie is that Terrence Howard was the first person who actually was hired to the film, and mainly because he was an Oscar-nominated actor who was really on a, a real high note at the time. 
he got paid the most money to be in this movie. He got paid $3.5 million to be in this. Whereas uh, Robert Downey Jr. only got paid 100000 in this. And, and according to Terrence Howard, it took John Favreau and Terrence Howard to convince Marvel to hire RDJ. Mainly because of his checkered past. So, and then when it came down to the sequel, um, uh, again, this is according to Terrence Howard, he said that John Favreau was not happy with what he saw out of Terrence Howard, and they were going to lowball him big time in the next movie. Uh, I think the, the number that they, he gave was 850000 was what they're going to offer after giving him $3.5 million from the first one. And they were going to cut his role. So, basically, he didn't accept it. And he thought it was going to be a, a, a tactic to get more money uh, from Marvel. And Marvel just turned around and said, oh, we're just going to replace you. And they replaced him with Don Cheadle. So, yeah, that that's the story of Terrence Howard in this movie and why he is no longer in any of the MCU movies. Which, like I said in the in the beginning, or in in the in the review, I think it was what's best in this because he just did not fit as Rhodey in the movie. But I I do understand as to why they hired him. Like he is a good actor, but just didn't fit well in this one. So, you want to get to the uh, our final thoughts? Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's. Why don't you go ahead? Um, as far as final thoughts go, um, in uh, 2020, I still think Iron Man um, from 2008 is a great film to watch. It's mm. just um, it doesn't take itself for more than what it is. It's just fun. It pulls off the trope of the lovable asshole just so, so right. And I think that's really down to just um, Robert Downey Jr. just pulling pulling off that sort of personality with a lot of bravado and charisma. And the action's okay. Um, it's not anything super special or super crazy, but um, it's fun enough. And there is some humor and levity to kind of break up sort of the real tense moments and everything, especially with the um, Mark II and Mark III suit testing and everything. Yeah. So, so there's that. But um, overall, just I still think it's a fun movie. And I would say just for anyone out there who's not the biggest comic fan and hasn't seen this, yeah. Give it a shot. It's just a lot of fun, and uh, you might change your mind on on superhero movies. Yeah, I mean, I I agree most of what you're saying. This is the Robert Downey Jr. show, and unless you just have a complete aversion to him, I think this is a very good film. It's it's held up. God, it's been thir- almost 15 years since it was out. Um, yeah, it, it's a it's a great film. Um, it really shows the charisma of Robert Downey Jr. I mean, I'll, 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 I'll throw this out there, okay? If Johnny Depp can get an Oscar nomination for Pirates of the Caribbean, I don't see how Robert Downey Jr. couldn't have gotten one for this. Like, it's that good. It, it is a it is a career-defining performance. Uh, it is a fun performance. It's charismatic. He owns the film. He is the film in this movie. And, it, and he just owns every single frame of the movie and is entertaining to watch. Um, like you said, action isn't so hot in this, but as a character movie and just and just enjoying uh, just like a really good, really charismatic performance, it's, it's a solid movie. It's really good. And it's not a surprise that this jumpstarted the MCU into what it is. Because without it, you wouldn't have the MCU. And... This again, it's just a really good film. So if you are one of the few who haven't seen it, re- yeah, give it a shot. But if you have seen it and you've been like me watching all the MCU films and following them since then, I'd say go ahead and watch it again just to get a feel of to how it started and how well it fits with everything still. So, yeah, solid film, really good movie. I I still enjoyed it. All right, Zero, so we're at the end of the episode here, but as always, I have a question for you. All right. Okay, so 
If you watched the previous episode of our games podcast that's on the feed, you notice that you already know that I've already told Zero of the question. So I'm going to let you guys know a little secret. I did the same thing here on this episode because, good God, if I sprung this on him, he would be here probably for 20 minutes figuring out what he wanted, and we didn't want that. So, Zero, my question is this. Barnes & Noble is having a 50% off sale for the Criterion Collection. And as a movie nerd like me, it is one of the best times of the year because it gives me the reason to spend irresponsibly on movies that, frankly, I probably watch once, but just enjoy them anyway and watch all the special features and stuff because I'm a Criterion head. I like like collecting them, whatever. Okay, anyway, aside from that, if you were to buy something from the 50% off Criterion's collection sale at Barnes Noble. What would you buy? Um, I think it's really uh, split between uh, three things. Okay. Uh, because um, I quite like um, the black exploitation genre and everything because it kind of captures an era. Mm-hmm. Um, the Shaft um, Criterion Collection Edition. That one just is superb because just. Shaft is a great movie. <laughs> that cover pops. Like, yes, it does. It, oh my god! Like that's, I I was gonna get Shaft anyway, but when I saw that cover, I was like, oh my god! Instant purchase. Holy shit! That, that's yeah. Nice. So so that's one. Um, the second one um, is m- really more something that um, kind of has a sentimental value uh, to me. And that would be um, the Seventh Samurai uh, Blu-ray uh, set, mostly because just uh, for the longest while, just finding a Region One copy of Seventh Samurai was just a giant pain in the ass. And yeah. um, many years ago, a close friend of mine had gifted me a copy of Seven Samurai, but there was a bit of a problem with the copy she had given me. It was a Region Two, Ooh. so. Um, I had to have a friend uh, who had a uh, USB-powered uh, Blu-ray drive go ahead and rip uh, the um, video files off of the disc. Yeah. And I... while that's okay, just for me, it's one of those things that I would like to at least be able to watch it on my home theater uh, via um, via something like uh, my Xbox Series X or if I end up eccentric enough to go and pick up a dedicated blu-ray player maybe one of those but yeah just mm. uh, that's that's something that um i would probably highly consider as well too yeah. seven samurai is one of those movies that when you get into the criterion collection is kind of a requirement to buy mainly because i guess it's because of how hard it was to get it at first but because Kurosawa in the collection is so well represented in this in this entire collection. Like he had most of his films are in there. So, but Seven Samurai is a stone cold classic. That if you're into film and you're into I guess classic film, you you, you want to watch that movie because of how uh, how influential it was. So yeah, that doesn't surprise me that you want Seven Samurai. I have Seven Samurai. Um, and then I think really the last one that I would probably um, um, advise people to pick up would be the World of Wong Kar Wai collection. Okay. Um, mostly because just um, love, love, love a lot of um, his movies and everything. And I watched it on very low resolution VCDs and, oh, wow. and to give you just um, a perspective of um, how far back I've I've watched um, his movies and everything. <laughs> that's, that's from the 90s, isn't it? Yeah, VCDs wow. were like a 90s format. Just um, uh, lower quality than DVD, but very popular in Asia for a good while. Um, um, let me just preface by saying uh, I, I do like Wong Kar Wai. There is an issue with the Wong Kar Wai collection. A lot of people have been having a hard time with it in regarding to skipping frames and color correction issues. So they may have they may have um, actually fixed that, but I keep hearing people on a forum I'm on that say they have constant problems with that collection. So be forewarned, if you buy it, you may have an issue, but 
I think they've corrected it. So I just wanted to just point that out. Yeah, um, but that would be uh, that would definitely be one that I would probably advise people to pick up um, mm-hmm. as long as well it's fixed or um, it doesn't have any issues. Right. I don't know since I don't own it, so. <laughs> It's the only reason why I haven't bought it yet, because I keep hearing that people have had problems with it. So, Okay, so every time one of these sales pops up, whether it's Criterion in their flash sale or Barnes & Noble with theirs, I end up buying 10 apiece. <laughs> Holy shit. They're half price. They're usually about 40 bucks. So they're 20 when you get them on this. So I just, I, I splurge almost every, like I think, well, the last time I only got five, so I didn't splurge that badly, but I think I'm going to do 10 this time as well. And here is what I'm looking for. Uh, Double indemnity is what I'm looking for. Shaft, of course, is what I'm looking for. The worst person in the world. Uh, I might get the Yojimbo and Sanjiro box set. Speaking of uh, Kurosawa, um, I missed out on getting One Night in Miami when it came at, when, uh, last time. I'm not missing that again, so I'm getting One Night in Miami. Mirror is another one I'm thinking about getting. Uh, what else? Celine and Julie go bowling. That's one that was really hard to find that's now available. So I will get that probably what else will i get the bruce lee collection maybe we'll we'll see uh do i want a cassavetes uh all that jazz I, I'm, I'm probably gonna get that uh what else i'm literally going through my wish list which is about 320 long and <laughs> i'm just I, I okay i've 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 said plenty i think at this point but yeah like these when these sales happen i splurge and and the reason why is because the quality of the transfer is so good and the supplements they give are really good that even if i don't like the movie if i end up not liking the movie i end up enjoying the supplements a lot so oh women on the verge of a nervous breakdown god that's a great movie that's another one so yeah i i generally just end up it, like again, again, if I if I don't enjoy the movie, I enjoy the supplement. So I I've actually never regretted a purchase. Uh, it, well, no, that's not exactly true. I I I purchased Videodrome thinking I'd watch it one day, but then I realized what was in it, and I realized I couldn't watch it. So now I have a movie that I will never watch, and it's just sitting in my collection. Like, okay, Ooh. yeah. I mean, I should have... Oh, the Witch Stillman trilogy. Jesus Christ, I forgot about that. Um, yeah, so there's there's a, there's a that one, I, I would say, that maybe I regret. But I can give that to somebody who likes really screwed up movies, and I have a friend who is. So, hey, Christmas gift. So there. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm going to stop looking, because I'll just come up with more that I'll probably buy. But yeah. Uh, those are my selections. I'll probably get more than that. So there we go. Anyway, so with that, we have come to the end of our podcast. And with that, we announced what we're going to watch next. And we decided that the next movie we're going to watch as part of our patriotic films for July 4th is Tony Scott's 1986 action film Top Gun, starring. Tom Cruise and Kelly McGinnis. Um, I'm curious. Have you seen Top Gun? Very, very long ago. Um, I, with my dad. Really? Okay. I've actually never seen it. <laughs> so this is going to be interesting. And since Top Gun Maverick has basically made about a billion dollars now and, and still is making money in the box office... It's going to be really interesting watching that and then watching Maverick when it comes out on a, on a, um, streaming. So, yeah. Okay. So, next week we're going to be watching Top Gun uh, if you want to join us. So, tune in next week when we watch Top Gun. Uh, I am The Wiz. And I'm Zero. And we will talk to you next time. Bye-bye.